Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so my name is Paula. I work in Vlis, and my colleague Daphne is also from Vlis. We will be introducing you um, about the biological data. I really don't know if any of you have already experienced with uh, either collecting or dealing with uh, data on biodiversity. Could you more or less raise your hands if you haven't, if you have done it? In, okay, four. <laughs> I think four or so. Yeah. It's uh, promising. <laughs> uh, so I hope this is not too uh, too hard for you. So actually, we will have a small introduction about what we mean by biological data, uh, because I think many of you are not familiar with how we sample the data and what we need to collect. Um, then we will introduce uh, the biological, the standard that we use for biological data, which is called OBIS Event Core. Um, we'll talk about two important standards, uh, the VODC vocabulary, which you are all familiar with them, I think, uh, but there are some parameters, some vocabulary specific for biological data. And more importantly, what you're probably not so familiar with is the taxonomy standard, which is uh, extremely important for biodiversity data. Uh, so we will have a small uh, exercise uh, on how to standardize your data uh, to the taxonomic standards that we use. Um, and then we will have a small introduction to the biodef, so the uh, adaptation uh, of the C data net format for biological data. And finally, um, we will view uh, some, some uh, tools that you, you have available to, to, quali to check the quality of your data using R. I first introduce a bit the, the, well, the landscape in biological data. <laughs> Uh, so we here in Bliss uh, receive uh, data from different providers and that can be in different formats. Um, it can be just an Excel file or a CSV file or something. Sometimes um, the other data centers upload their data into the IPT. So that's the Integ Integrated Publishing Toolkit um, from which we can automatically harvest the data. So it's a tool to publish biodiversity data. Uh, or you can uh, also provide your data via cdata.net and then we just have to transform it also into the OBIS event core format. That will flow to the Eurobis database, which is a European node of OBIS, a larger a global uh, biodiversity uh, well, initiative for uh, ocean uh, data. And that can also flow to GBIT, which, which is another global uh, initiative for biodiversity data, but that also includes terrestrial data. From the European node of OBIS, uh, we will also, the data will also flow to Imonet Biology. So that's a bit how it works. Um, and you are, of course, probably uh, providing data either through CDATANET or some other uh, means. So what do we mean by biodiversity? The classical or the most uh, um, simple definition of biodiversity is variety of life found in a place on earth and a classical indicator of uh, biodiversity is to, to look at which species appear on, on a particular place at a time. Uh, so the basic information that we're looking for is what, which species, where and when they're found. Uh, but of course we need much more than that because we also want to see how that evolves uh, and uh, we need to know how many of them are found, uh, under which environmental conditions, and how all this is changing with time. So, um, okay, normally here it would say <laughs> uh, pelagic, I think. Normally these slides uh, were uh, Google slides, so I think there has been some trouble uh, transformating that to PowerPoint. But um, the idea is that we have two main blocks of uh, types of, bi uh, um, sorry, marine, um, biological sampling. One is in the water column, which are called pelagic uh, organisms. Uh, and these are two main techniques to collect uh, biological data. For larger organisms, we will use uh, pelagic trolls. For smaller or microscopical organisms like plankton, we will use uh, nets. Um, it's very important to record which type of net is used for how long it was in the water, if it's a troll in um, net, we need to know at which speed it was uh, deployed, and so on and so on. Uh, for benthic or demersal organisms, which is the title missing here, uh, so these are organisms that live either in the substrate or very close to the substrate. Uh, we also use for our, um, other types of um, instruments, like a bottom or demersal trolls, 
and also to go into the sediment we used things like cores or grabs and things like that and then um, apart from knowing which species we uh, we find there we need to know things like what was the life stage so did we find a larvae or an adult or a juvenile or whatever uh, sometimes we need to measure also uh, especially for fisheries management is very important to know biometrics uh, we also want to know uh, not only if we are still finding the same species but whether we are finding the same type of population are we actually finding a smaller and smaller species because we're fishing them uh, uh, before when they're adults. Um, also, uh, we take measurements not only about the length of the body, but maybe other parts of the body as an indication of uh, the age or the, uh, I don't know, the uh, sexual maturity, for example. We measure either the abundance or biomass or both. Um, it is important to measure other environmental parameters together with these uh, biological parameters. So. If it's for pela especially for pelagic organisms, we are interested in knowing temperature, salinity, oxygen, um, chlorophyll, for example, pigment, nutrients. Uh, and if we are talking about demersal or uh, benthic organisms, we need to know the characteristics of the sediments. So we can also measure uh, grain size or sediment type or even other geochemical uh, characteristics of the sediment. And yeah, this is just a slide with some of the sampling techniques. We also need to know, uh, it's important to know if there are replicas, for example, that needs to be recorded in the data set as well. Um, as I said, if we are, depending on which instruments we are using, we need to know the size of the net, how long it was deployed, etc, etc. So how do we actually capture all these complexities and different types of samples and the methodology and the effort and so on? So that's, um, it takes me to the overview of the biological data format, what I mentioned that was uh, the OBIS event core. I see that the titles of my slides are missing, but <laughs> I hope you can follow. Um, so the OBIS event core, um, we have to take into account three main blocks when we talk about this, uh, this uh, schema. Uh, one is about the structure, and the data is structured in three tables. We will see them uh, later with a bit more detail. Uh, the event table, the occurrence table, and the measurements or facts table. Then um, the fields, the name of the fields need also be to, uh, to be standardized. So the, they follow certain uh, vocabulary, which are called the Darwin core terms. Um, and I, we put links there. You can, well, <laughs> there are hundreds of terms uh, because uh, the Darwin core is, um, is a schema for uh, biodiversity data. So it not only for marine, but for other, uh, also for terrestrial. So there are a lot of terms that don't apply to the to this specific uh, oceanographic schema. Uh, so the list is huge. So I later on I just put a well a sample of what of the most important fields are. But you can have a look at the whole uh, list there. And also we use control vocabulary and standards for the content itself. So we have three tables, we, we have standards for how we name each column inside each of these three tables, and we have standards also to uh, how we're going to fill in the, the tables themselves. So, as I said, the Darwin core is a very, uh, well, flexible and, and a schema. Uh, normally, if there is a star or core table in the center. In the case of uh, Immonet biology, this is the event core table. <laughs> And then there are uh, extension records, um, and in, the case, in this case we have two extensions, which I mentioned, the occurrence and the, uh, and the extended measurements or facts. So um, what we're going to put in the event table is everything related to the sample, so uh, the date, the depth, uh, the coordinates, and so on. Um, what we're going to put in the occurrence table is everything related to the taxonomy, so which species were observed in each of, in each of these samples, and uh, it has to be standardized. We will see later on in an exercise. And then all the rest of the measurements are going to go in the extended measurements of facts. And if it's a measurement related to the, to the station, for example, we took a, the temperature of the water, it will be linked to the event table. If it's a measurement related to the species, such as the uh, life stage or uh, abundance or other type of biological measurements, it will be related to the occurrence table, also with the event. Um, so this is a bit the structure. We will see an example later. Um, so event core, yes, we have information about the, the sampling and the hierarchy. 
of the sampling. Uh, we can have measurements related to the sample, uh, so which device was used uh, and the sampling effort. And also if we collected uh, benthic samples, we, we can have directly to the sample, we can have uh, information about the sediment type or grain site and so on. Then we have the occurrence table where we store our taxonomical uh, data, as I said. So we will have a list of species that were recorded in each of the samples. And in the same table, so actually it's separated, but this is the same table, these two. But in the same table, we can also have measurements related to the species themselves, such as uh, abundance or length or many others. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about the name, uh, the names that you have to use for each of these uh, columns. Uh, but here you have an overview of what's the classical content that you find in the table and which are the field names that should be used and which are the uh, obligatory, the mandatory ones. But as I said, you have a full list with definitions uh, in the link. Uh, what is more important is to talk about the uh, standards and especially the taxonomic standards. Uh, all of the fields really, well, some of them are free text, but most of them are controlled by um, by different standards. So date is ISO and the coordinates have to be WGS84 and so on. Um, but most importantly, the measurements of facts table where we put all the information about either uh, the sampling device or the sampling effort or uh, information about environmental uh, conditions or about uh, biological measurements of the species. Uh, all of that has to follow control vocabulary. I think you're all familiar with the BODC vocabulary um, and why it is used for. Uh, so I put here some examples about how it looks in the uh, measurements of fact tables. So you have an occurrence ID. In another table, you will have a lot of a list of species linked to this occurrence ID. Um, and in this case, to this occurrence ID, I measured an abundance. This is the uh, parameter, the BODC parameter for abundance. The value is 26, so we actually found 26 of this uh, specimen. And the measurement unit is individuals. Same for density, same for biomass. So I don't know which, by heart which species this was, but that's the biomass we found, that's the abundance we found, and so on. And linked to the event directly, we can have information about the sampling effort, we could have information about sediment type and so on. So um, here are some links, uh, for example, can I, yes, here you have a tool uh, to check most of, or the most relevant uh, parameters that we usually uh, use for biological data, uh, so related to biomass, for example, or uh, sediment, and so on. So in those links, I'm not, I'm not gonna <laughs> go through all the definitions stuff. But you can uh, check those links, and here you have a comprehensive, you have a list of m most of the useful parameters that will be used for biology, uh, that has been compiled by Obis. And here we have an example of a fully processed data set. So I cannot see wait. here. So we have these three tables. Can you see them? So event, occurrence, and extended measurements of facts. In the events, okay, dismissed. In the event, uh, we have the information about the sampling event. So we have an event ID. We know it's a sample. We know where it was collected, the latitude and longitude. Um, I put that one in blue. So in the occurrence table, we have all the occurrences related to that event. So all these species were found in that sample. And this is the standard. And you will see later on how you can get this standard, this uh, taxonomical this taxonomic ID, scientific name ID. And here you have one occurrence, this species. And in the extended measurement of facts, you are going to find, I'm going to filter that out. The filter by color? No. <laughs> OK, it didn't work. Okay, 
So for this species, I have a density, abundant and weight, uh, wet, weight biomass, as I said, um, that are linked to that species in the occurrence table. And then I also have other measurements related to the sample. Uh, I'm gonna just clear and get all the blanks. So I have to each of the samples, I have all these measurements related directly to the sample. So I have the instrument name, uh, the vertical opening, the trolling speed, the mesh, uh, the size of the mesh, and so on and so on. So this is how it's uh, structured. And this is, of course, following the ODC parameters. So it's, I know it's a PowerPoint, sorry. So uh, my colleague Daphne will uh, now explain how you actually do the, the taxon match. Uh, which is one of the most important parts of the uh, standardization process. So, um, in, bi in biological data, if you have biological data set, the, the most important thing in there is, is a scientific name. Um, and the scientific name, of course, it needs to be standardized for several reasons. Mm -hmm. Because, well, some scientific names, um, they are written in, uh, in Latin. And some scientific names are, are quite complicated. Uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce this name. But it's easy to see that if you're trying to write this name by hand, that you are going to make some mistakes and these are three diff these are four different examples of how we saw that name being written this the name the, the all mean um, they all mean the, they all mean the same name but it's written differently and um, these are some examples on how we decide in data sets um, now some other reason that data needs the, the Scientific names need to be standardized is because there are different ways that you can write a scientific name correctly. Um, for example, this species you can include you can include the, the variety that the right the, the name the, you can type var, or you can include the the name of the author, and you can even uh, uh, include the name of a previous author. Um, other reasons is that, well, uh, scientific names, different authors then might have, uh, different authors, uh, if, uh, different people may have uh, described the same species again. So these are like three different, uh, so this is one species which was found by four different authors and in um, 1766 Palas has found this uh, a specimen of this species, and he thought it was a new species, and he described it as Alachondria. Um, in uh, in 1868, uh, uh, Parfit found the same species in the water, and he thought it was an, it was a species that hasn't been described yet, and he and he described it again. And for this one particular sponge, this has been done more than 60 times. So there are six, more than 60 names for exactly the same species. And um, a fourth reason is that, well, um, the same, a same, uh, no, uh, the same name can be used, could have been used to describe different species. For example, this, so this is a copy pot, a parasitic copy pot that has attached itself to, um, to a fish. And this is a sponge. So um, one author has found this, this uh, copy pot and it has named it Alebion. Another author has found this sponge that has also named it Ab 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 Alebion. So when you're talking about Alebion, are you talking about the copy pot or are you talking about the sponge? So to solve this, um, the World Register of Marine Species has been created, which is a register for, for scientific names. All names that have ever been 
described by uh, all marine species names that have ever been described are included in that that register and it says for each of those names uh, which is the the accepted name which is the one that that should be used it also deals with taxonomy it also says well this species belongs to this family it belongs to this class this film uh, it's managed by experts and uh, it also includes different traits of species. So it can say that, for example, for the blue whale, it can um, it, uh, an ad adult species of that whale can be, be between I don't know 10 meters and 15 meters or whatever, and all different kind of characteristics that can be associated to that um, species. Um, uh, it also can include distribution where the species is likely to occur according to those experts and because of these reasons we are um, we are using the world register of marine species as a techno, techno, uh, taxonomic backbone for uh, for immunite biology and uh, in obis so that means that as Paula said all um, all scientific names in the data set needs to be accommodated accommodated with a, a scientific name ID which links to the world register of marine species so you do it as such, you have one column scientific name and another column scientific name ID. So now we are going to uh, do uh, an exercise on this, on how you get the scientific name IDs uh, for, uh, yeah, for the scientific name. So on the Ocean Teacher platform, um, you can see here a class exercise taxon match. You can open that. And then here you see um, three files. So I've prepared here a file with uh, nine scientific names for which you would get the uh, uh, standardized to uh, and get the uh, scientific name ID for. Um, now let's look at some of those names here in that file. And what can you tell about these names? This is an example of names that you can get in a data set when it's um, submitted to you. Are these good scientific names? Well, when, if you look at the one that I marked here, Attilis larvae, well, larvae is probably not going to be part of the scientific name. It's, um, it's probably a life, life stage. Probably what uh, the person who submitted his data set here was trying to say is, OK, I have found some, uh, a specimen of the genus Attilus. And I think it's a larvae. So that should not be in the file when you do a taxon match. Um, other things that you can find here is that, for example, um, the, the name of the author and the year that the, the scientific name was published can be included in there. So the first thing that we'll need to do is, is clean up this file and say, um, I have a column here which is the, which is the clean scientific name, and then and then other columns with all the other uh, scientific, uh, all the other information that is relevant, uh, but is not part of the scientific name. So I actually did that already for you.
Yeah, I know, but why is it doing that? Hmm. So, uh, what? A little, but it's cloudy, baby. It'll be fine. Um, okay. Yeah, um, so, well, okay, it's a comma separated file, so there was a comma right here, so we, this row is a little bit uh, not as it should be. Uh, but it's, uh, well, so you should clean up your scientific names and keep them uh, and have the clean scientific names and then another column with the author and then another column with the live stage. I think I'm going to remove this one. <laughs> so, when, so you can download this file. And then you can uh, go to the World Register of Marine Species and perform a taxon match. So there's a link here on the top, which takes you to uh, the, the, well, the page on the marine species website where there's a tool available uh, where you can upload a file, a CSV file, an Excel file, or a TXT file, um, and then the tool will perform um, Give you will return you the scientific name IDs um, that associated to that uh, um, to that name. So. So I select the, you select the file. You see that the first row contains column names. Um, it's, a, it's a comma delimiter. And you want to match up to scientific name. Uh, if you know that the file that's provided to you, if it's uh, only polychaetes or only nematodes, then you can start that, that type here that it's only um, polychaetes or nematodes. You can um, but this is not the case for this data set. So what we'll need is we need the, the LS ID, the life science ID. That's what we need for 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 Eurobis. Um, and this, so you can select whatever you you want here. Right? Um, you, the API ID that's the identifier in the system, the of, of the worms of worms itself, the LS ID, life science life science ID. The scientific name according to um, two worms. Uh, if there's some small spelling spelling variations, then selecting this will give you as output the 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 name prop, uh, written correctly according to worms. You can have the, the accepted name. You probably want that as well. Uh, so if there are a lot of synonyms, synonyms, then it will give you the, the accepted synonym if you click this one. Mm, well, you can have. Also, environment that will tell you if it's a marine taxon or a terrestrial taxon. But so then you press next, and then it will read in your file. And okay, it's reading it not as great. Um, it's reading this one uh, wrongly, but the other ones are seem to be okay. Um, I'll go ahead with the. Uh, 
back so much anyway. So you need to say here that this column scientific name, that it is the scientific name. And you'll need to say, or you could say, this is one is not mandatory scientific name author. You can say here that this column is scientific name author. You don't need to look at the other ones. And it will match the scientific name and the scientific name of the author. So you press next match. And then you get here uh, uh, a view file saying everything in green is, has been matched automatically. Um, the one in red here, none, it cannot find, uh, the tool could not find uh, a match for the name Atelier's Nonsense, which is not really a surprise because nonsense is probably not a valid scientific name. Um, and it has this one here with saying this is ambiguous. What does that mean? It means that this name is known um, in worms uh, multiple times. So these are homonyms. Um, different authors have given the same name to different specimens. So you need to go. Um, you need to go back to the person who has provided you the data, and uh, and ask. Well. This name is it? Did, uh, did you mean the specimen described by uh, by Riso or by Kuhl and Hafen and Van Hassel, or or which one did you mean? So we cannot decide here now which one it was. So then you can download your file. And okay, yeah. And so what you get is for each scientific name, you get the you get the the LS ID which you need, and you get the the name according to worms as it should be right. I think. The FE ID of the of the accepted name. So. If in case of synonyms, it would give you uh, how it should be, what is the, the accepted name. So it's now the system is saying, well, I know this name, but this is the, the proper name. That's the one that you should use. And it will also tell you if the match was exact or if it was um, some spelling variations. Like near two means that two different characters were different in uh, as the name is spelled here in the file that you provided uh, in comparison with, um, with the name in Worms. So. so any questions? Um, thanks so much. I also provided here the, if you did it yourself, um, the file that you should come out and saying, well, there's three, there's three, uh, uh, there's three names that you may need to check. If it's two, two letters were different, you, you might, may want to put a check with your provider if, well, in this case, it's probably correct. But you may need to verify with your provider if it's um, if it is effective if it really is that name that was meant. Moving on. So um, now we've been talking about the data standards in uh, 
in Europeus and Obeus and, uh, and Immanuel biology. So what has this to do with uh, C data net and C data cloud? Well, we want to also be able to provide biological data in, uh, in C data cloud. Um, but if data is uploaded in C data cloud, the idea is that that data from, should flow from C data cloud into, uh, into Eurobis in the first step, and then from Eurobis to OBIS, then GBIF, and Immanent Biology. So that the same data from there is, it flow, is, is automatically transformed uh, into the OBIS ENV format and will be then available in all the different portals as well. So we created a format um, largely based on the, on the Eurobis uh, data format. And we try to use the same terms as much as possible and to try to use um, a similar structure also as much as possible. And well, the outcome is what we call the biological data exchange format or biodef. And uh, we have a, a world doc work document here describing the, the format in quite some detail. I'll present it to you now. So the format consists of um, CDI metadata, as it's mandatory for um, ODD, ODV files. Um, we're in the second version already of the ODV, um, of the, this variant, and um, it contains the semantic header, as all other ODVs need. It's the nine mandatory ODV files. Um, we also define uh, fields. Nine mandatory ODDV fields. We also defined nine mandatory biodef fields. If you're using the biological data format, then you need to provide those nine fields. Um, there are also conditional biodef fields. In in case of some certain type of data, you will need these. If in other types of data, you will need those other types, um, those other fields. Um, there are some optional fields. In case if you have um, an abundance, then you can you can use the column abundance, and it also includes quality flags. So this is what it looks like, a semantic header, uh, the mandatory ODV files, of ODV fields, the mandatory biodef fields, and any optional fields. And well, we listed a whole bunch of optional fields, but well, the other optional fields can be created if upon need. Um, so the mandatory ODV fields, you all know them. Uh, the mandatory biodef fields, we need the minimum depth of your observation, the maximum depth of your observation. So, um, in, if you're having a bottom sample, a graph, then the minimum depth and the maximum depth are going to be the same. But if you're using a plankton net and you're... Um, Taking a hole from, I say, 15 meters depth to the surface, then well, your minimum depth is zero meters and your maximum depth is 15 meters. We need an identifier for the sample sample ID. We need the um, sampling effort. And for this field, there may be four different, uh, four possible PO1 codes. Uh, sampling effort may refer to the, the area sampled of the bed. So if you're taking a graph, then that would be um, the surface area of that graph. If you're um, talking, um, if you're taking uh, a Niskin bottle, then that could be the volume of the Niskin bottle. If you are taking an, uh, uh, a beam trough, um, for, then that could be the length of that you're trawling your beam trough. Uh, sampling duration may, well, if you are uh, putting out a pike or a, a net, uh, leave it in the water and then after a day or something you come back and you pick up your net, then in that case your sampling effort would be a duration. Scientific name, scientific name ID are mandatory. Uh, the sex of the, the specimen, the, the life stage and the observed individual count. How many of that specimen did you find in the, in the sample? Um, conditional fields, in case uh, start event date and 
end event state in case that you are uh, in the, in the, in, uh, in case you're sampling for a time range. So the example of the of the flag. Uh, when you're using a beam trial, then you would want to um, record the start and the end coordinates uh, of the trial. So the coordinates that you put the, the beam trial in the water and the coordinates that you take it out. Um, in case if you have subsampling, then your subsample ID and subsample coefficient are mandatory. Um, subsample coefficient means that uh, which percentage of um, of the entire sample is taken by your subsample. So, for example, if you're beam drawing and there's like um, some thousand different, some if that thousand, you find thousand times the one particular animal, then maybe you don't want to count, count on 1,000, you want to say, okay, I'm only counting one fourth, and then uh, the subsample coefficient would be um, 0 0.25, because you only looked at one fourth of the sample. Other um, conditional fields were sampling protocol and occurrence status. Sampling protocol can be filled out with a link to um, a paper or a manual describing in quite some detail how the sample is taken. Occurrence status is, ma uh, is mandatory in case that you have um, absence data. Uh, so occurrence status would be present or absent that you, you fit out that. And if, yeah, so if you have absences, then that is mandatory. Optional fields are abun like abundances, uh, weights, coverage, so different types of biotech quantification, depending on what you have in, in your data set. Um, again, biometrics, depending on what you have available in your data set, uh, you can add optional uh, fields. And also abiotic measurements that were taken together with your sample. Uh, uh, Europe is also very interested in that. Habitat types. So, um, so this is how a file would look like. We have a second example uh, exercise prepared for you here. We have um, a file here called BioDev template and examples. Um, which contains the template, the biological data template, um, uh, the different optional fields that we have um, identified as probably very relevant when you're trying to create, um, uh, trying to store biological data, and two different examples, one for a macrobentos and one for um, zooplankton. Um, so the exercise is now that you look at the, this, this template and those examples for, I don't know, for 10 minutes or something, and then um, if you have questions, uh, I will be happy to answer them. So... Um, we're also working on QC procedures to verify that um, the data that we get are good. Um, and we are working on automatic procedures so that you would, when, when data is submitted, um, your provider gets feedback quite automatically. Um, things that can be, uh, things that can be uh, checked automatically are, well, are all mandatory fields present? Um, are all mandatory present uh, fields present and filled out? It can be checked quite easily. Then a third check is, well, are they in the, in the correct format? Um, a good example for that is, well, you all know that dates are very difficult to write and there is one um, standard ISO format and, well, we should check if all um, dates that are provided are according to that format. Um, last check that can be done automatically in some cases is 
you know, the values that are provided are they are they possible? Um, I'm thinking, for example, um, you can check if coordinates are provided are they are they on land? If depths are provided are they are they possible? Or if you can you can compare the depths, the minimum depths that we get with, for example, uh, bathymetry layers, and and compare those. If the depths that we get are far below the bathymetry layers, then well, perhaps there's some problem with the coordinates or, or with the depths that we get. Um, we have uh, in Eurobis and Obis, we also have um, another QC procedure that does that you that we use as a, in the download as a filter, um, a fitness for purpose kind of filter. So the QC flags that we automatically calculate. Um, are looking at well these things, and then um, if there is no dates are provided, then they're flagged. The data is still there, and if um, somebody um, wants to know where uh, a taxon occurs, is not it's not relevant whether or not the date is provided. Um, it can still use that record that doesn't have a date to know if that species occurs. Uh, in the Atlantic Ocean or, or not, if it's a species, if it's a record saying it's a species in the Atlantic Ocean. So um, I will now demonstrate uh, uh, an R QC script that, that we have, and it's based on data sets uh, in formatted according to IPT. So according to the the guy the, the format that Paula uh, des described. Because um, that's the, the format that Orobis is focusing on. But um, as I said, also that the data from um, see data net should be converted uh, will be converted automatically into Orobis ENV format, and then um, some QC procedure, as I'm going to demonstrate, will be run on that, and then uh, you will get um, this kind of feedback um, as well. So um, it's a demo, but you also have the files that I'm going to show here on Ocean Teacher in the QC procedure demo data thing. And you can download here um, an R file. Um. Yeah. So I'll just open that file. Okay. okay. So Um, are people following with the R script? Or? Yes, no? Can you hand up your hands if you're following? Sorry, no? Okay, thanks. So the first list here are some dependencies. Um, you need to install some packages and, uh, and, and require them. So it's just, I'm just running them. Um, it may take a little bit of time for it to install those things, but not that much.
Okay, it takes some time. You only need to do it, only you need to do this once because once it's installed, it, it's there. Um, next time you open it, it will still be there. So while the script is, while it's installing packages, um, I'm going to be importing data through this through this link, um, which is uh, a Darwin Core archive file. And according to the, this, should not be deleting that. Which is um, exactly the format that. Paula described uh, control V. Does that work? Command C? Mm. Ah, it's Command C as well. So this is what an IPT um, resource looks like. That's what we use to exchange data. Um, it's it's an uh, it's a zip file with um, with um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I want to yeah, look at them. Okay, it should be on any download. Mm -hmm. oh, it's already extracted. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So it's a zip file containing the, the three uh, files an event, txt, an occurrence txt, the event core, the occurrence extension. The measurement of facts extension, and um, also um, a metadata file containing well, containing all the different all the metadata uh, of that data set in XML. And um, this is actually the the page that you see here is actually um, a visualization of that EML file. Um, so that's what we're going to be working with. Um, it's done. It's still not done. Um, well, after these packages have been installed, I will go um, import that zip file and run uh, QC checks on that. Mm -hmm. 
mir gezeigt. I think we're almost there. Okay. So the um, the dependencies have been installed. Um, so I can now. Um, import the data. So that's basically just running this code and now it's getting the data, downloading the data from the IPT uh, server and it's now in this out here. So I can now say that these tables from, um, from that zip file should be uh, imported as different tables. So just run this code, and now there's an, there's an event table, a um, measurement of facts table, and an occurrence table. Import it into R. So um, one of the first things that you'll need to do when you get a data set with three different tables is check the integrity. Um, are all the event IDs that occur in the, in the occurrence extension, do they link to an identifier in the in the in the event core, so you can. Um, that's basically what these checks do. Um, yeah, it's nothing fancy. It's nothing exciting. It's just um, the output is just a table listing all the different identifiers that are not um, um, that are that in from the occurrence table that are not available in the event table. Uh, there's nothing so. Uh, the output is empty. So um, a quite nice tool here is to flatten the uh, the event table and the occurrence table to combine the uh, the occurrences and uh, and the events into one single flat file, so that you have your coordinates and your scientific names nicely together in one file, um, so that you can run analysis on them. Um, that's the second bit here that's listed. So I've run this code and now I have um, uh, another ta a table with I'm Mm. Well, you have your occurrences next to your um, mm. okay. How many scroll time? I'm not familiar with Macintosh. But well, you see you have dates here. Okay. Um, so now we created a, a nice file with my, the occurrence information next to the, the event information. The event information is flat out, flattened out. Um, now you can check, well, is all mandatory fields that 
that that should be there is it there so there's a function called check fields in that obis tools package and so we can run that the output is then um, i put the output of that in the table fields and so uh, the output says here well on row 18 the field scientific name um, there's an empty value. Scientific name is not provided for open row um, 18. Uh, the same for occurrence status. There are three rows here that uh, where that information is missing. Um, so I now did some code here to delete um, a, an entire column to see what it looks like, the output, um, in case a mandatory column would be missing. So I'm now deleting just the column scientific name. I'm doing the same check fields um, check again. And yeah. Yeah. So now it says the required field scientific name is missing. Um, you can run on each of these checks independently, of course. You don't need to go from top to bottom as I'm doing. Um, another very important check is, well, are your um, coordinates located where they should be? So you have the function plot map in the OPS tools package. And basically, what it does, it just plots your coordinates. Uh, you can see here two different points which are not um, in together with the other ones. They're on land, they're probably suspect. So a cool tool that we have is check on land. Um, that returns you all the different um, uh, yeah, points that are not uh, in the water, but are located on land. So I'm running the check on land, and I'm putting it away in the table records on land. So I can now open the, the, the table records on land. And so what I get here is all 50, 43 records, um, which have coordinates on land. So I, can, I have those records now. I can look at those occurrence IDs, and I can get, go back to my provider and say, Hey, can you look at those occurrence IDs or these event IDs? Because they are probably not where they should be. Um, this is, check on land here, this is exact. You can also decide to say, um, you can also provide a buffer saying, okay, it's okay if it's on land, if it's less than, than one kilometer. Because, well, turtles may go on land sometimes to lay their eggs and they may go maybe 10, 20, 13 meters. So that could be a very valid record if you're in intertidal areas and stuff. Maybe you have some brackish water. Um, so you have the option to, to include a buffer here. I have not done so, but you could. And um, of course, you can plot the, the records that are on land. And then you have your plot of your records on land. Um, another quite cool tool is then you can check the, the depths in your data file, the minimum depths that are provided in your met data file, and compare them to um, to a bathymetry layer, depth bathymetry layer. You can see here as well uh, what is the the margin that you find acceptable. I'm putting here 250 if the depth uh, in my Data file is less than 250 meters below the depth according to GAPCO, then um, it's not going to give an error. It's quite big, 250. You can make it smaller. Um, but yeah, you can type here whatever you want. So I can run this code. And then I have. A depth report saying here that 
in row 10 and row 18, the depth value that was provided, um, 1,200 meters, it's uh, much, it's greater than the one according to the bathymetry raster, which says um, 150 meters above the seafloor. So probably um, it's one of those two uh, where it's on land, but well, because your depth is, so you know that there's something wrong with your coordinates because according to your depth, your, your point should be somewhere 1,002 meters depth. Um, so this one, 7,000 is greater than what's expected, 1,300. And you can plot those points that are suspect, and you'll get, well, those two points on land, and also this one here, which the data file has a depth of 7,000 and it was uh, only 1,300 or something expected. And now you can zoom on this type of map. Um, well, another important check is, are your dates valid against uh, the ISO format? So I'm running that. Uh, you can put it in, I've, so far I've always put it in a table, but you don't need to put it in a table. You can, if you don't put it in a table, it comes out in, in the console here. And it says, um, well, the depth, row uh, 12 here, a depth of, two, well, like that. This is not an ISO format. So this is returned here and tells me, hey, I need to look at row 12 and row 22. Uh, now the last QC function I want to show you. Um, it's quite a lot of work to do all those different checks separately. So what is here available is um, a simple function that does all those other things right at the same time. And it gives you a nice little hat HTML output. Um, saying everything that is wrong with, uh, with the data you provide. Um, so I think something like that will be um, the output of the CDTANET check service that we're making. Hmm. Or it could be. And take some time. Uh, while we're waiting for this, if you have questions on anything, yes. Okay. Well, um, in uh, Eurobis and Imanet, we don't have quality mm -hmm. flags on a, on a field level. So, um, so, well, if you are not certain of an identification, um, the current the, the I think the procedure is to, to write um, the level that you are certain of. So if you know it's this, this genus, then, then you can give, you should give that genus. And if you think it looks like that species, then you, well, biology people use confer, um, genus confer this species. So in Eurobis guidelines, it would be, you provide scientific name, the genus name, and then identification qualifier, um, I can confirm, I think it's that. Okay, and I have a second question. We have been um, publishing CDIs in the University of Data through the CDATA Net, but we also are partners in human biology. So I am wondering, is there a way to bypass the installation of IDP and to directly use the ODP files and the CDI files that we published in CDATA Net? Or then to be harvested and then into a uh, 
I think we need to see. Uh, uh, I think we will need to talk with you then. What is the the most efficient workflow uh, on that? So there are in Imonet's biology there are partners providing data to the data net, so that should be possible. But well, you're talking to Paula, so maybe Paula can. Uh, so, the, so after running that script, um, I got a nice HTML file saying data quality report, which has again the map of um, of all the points and it lists all the different issues. Hey, those different rows have coordinates on land. Uh, it plots those coordinates on land. Um, it only gives the first 25, and it only, plot, only plots the first 25. And that's why you don't have a world map here, because it's already zoomed. It says here that there is, um, on row 18, there is a one record with no scientific name, and it also plots where that the record is located. Either same with occurrence status. Um, same with event date, where are those located? Same with uh, those depth errors that we saw before. Again, it, it zooms, so you don't have the, the world map. And also, what can be useful? Oh. Okay. Uh, it checks against the OBIS database where you expect that the species is located. So we have a map here, um, which in uh, in yellow, where most points of OBIS are located, um, center point, and then in uh, in green here, those are your data points, and green means that. They are in, in inside the acceptable the expected range. The one here in red is not, um, or actually in pink, it's not inside the range where you expect. Um, where according to those all these variables, um, you don't expect that that species to occur. So this could be a really good way to to check uh, if the if it's either a new observation for that species in in a new region for Obis where I didn't know it yet, or maybe there's something uh, suspicious on those records. And in this case, that is quite likely. So, so yeah. Um, and that's the QC demo. Uh, we still have some time for some questions. Other people have them. Mm -hmm. Should be documented here. Okay. Yeah. 
an open statement. Yes, um, I think, well, this is, this, I haven't highlighted it enough, I guess, but the, the tool is developed by, by OBIS and um, colleagues at UNESCO. So I think standard is Skepco because that's, that's just world coverage. But I guess for what we will do at Blitz, we could, I think it would be probably better to, to, to do the Imanet patinetry, but something that, yeah, we will. I, the development still needs to start, so I would definitely, it's definitely a point that I'll give to our developers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's call it a day.